This afternoon, we've got some presentations that uh, Charlie has so graciously put together uh, for the afternoon session, and I'm going to let him introduce those. But uh, I think uh, these are all timely. They're all going to be informative, and I think you're going to enjoy them. So if you would, Charlie. Thank you, Ron. We're doing something just a little bit different this year in that um, the ETI Tool Tech meeting has a, a theme of OEMs in the aftermarket, a new direction, and renewed partnerships. And what this has to do with is a concept that um, we think that the, we are, we're, we're just kind of capitalizing on a trend, actually. I think many OEMs are already see the, see the advantages of working closely with the aftermarket. And have found that not, not only can it be rewarding, but it can be profitable. And uh, so th this theme is to revisit that connection between uh, the aftermarket and the OEMs and talk about ways that we can work together. And rather than treat this meeting completely separate from Tooltech, we're kind of kicking off Tooltech at this point with, with talks that have to do with that theme. And then we'll just roll into the regular Tooltech part tomorrow and continue the theme. So this time, and I think it did help our, uh, the number of people that showed up this year. I think it, uh, this is a, a pretty good crowd, better than we have had in some of our previous general meetings. So it may be a good idea. And so because of that, and since uh, I run ETI, it was my job to put together the presentations for this part of the meeting. Now, uh, we're going to kind of continue this idea, I believe, at ASRW. And therefore, it will be Ron's responsibility <laughs> to, to, to put together the speakers for the general meeting in the fall. Uh, we put three presentations together uh, for you t today. I think you're going to find them all worthwhile. Um, let me get to this thing so I can make sure I get this all right. The first uh, presentation is going to be by Mark Warren and Rob Morrell with WorldPAC. Uh, they were nice enough to invite me to speak at their event, and it was quite an eye-opener for me. I learned some things that I didn't know, and one of the things that, you know, that no one denies that one of the biggest gaps in service information is the, to find out what it is you need from a training standpoint to support the aftermarket. And the World Pack puts on a, a, a show every two years, maybe they're going to do it more often in the future, where they actually had 850 technicians come to their meeting to receive some OEM quality uh, training. And so one of the things they're going to talk about is what that process is like, uh, what works, what doesn't work, what OEMs can do better in the future, and I think you're going to find that very interesting. I know I was really amazed at what I learned at that uh, conference. Uh, Tony Amiglio, I get, we had two people, Garrett Delaney and Tony Amiglio with Worldwide um, Environmental Systems, so, but only Tony can make it, but he's going to give a talk on uh, an update on i and programs across the nation and uh, primarily, or one of the, specifically on the California BAR program that's pending. Uh, which we haven't really visited in a long time. It's been a long time since we've actually talked about i and and, of course, that is a bit an important part of the repair industry. And then lastly, uh, we're going to ask Tony to come back to the podium to talk about an initiative ASE is doing where they're combining efforts amongst their own organizations and some outside organizations, perhaps, uh, to put together uh, education, education programs for aftermarket uh, hopefully, with again, with some OEM quality capabilities, um, an idea to bring automotive youth education type systems, which the OEMs use, uh, to the aftermarket. So with that, I'm going to bring up, uh, Mark, are you the one that's going to give the presentation? I want to just give a little background on, on um, Mark. Um, he, he currently helps manage the World Pack Training Institute. He also authors Motors Drivability Corner column and has been a motor columnist since 1998. 
He's an ASC certified master automotive technician with L1 and SAE affiliate member and past president of the Service Technician Society. A recognized expert on engine performance and drivability. Mark studied mechanical engineering at the University of Arizona. Mark's auto opened in 1976 and has been at the present location since 1983. The business was downsized in 1998 to primarily involved in training, writing, research, and consulting. Uh, Mark's main interests are automotive diagnostics, processes, techniques, and testing, and other interests include family, poker, frisbee, golf, hiking, backpacking, spelunking, as long as the areas are not too narrow, and camping. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Um, while Mark's coming up, we actually got a, uh, an email from somebody in the audience. We, we were wondering um, if, if we could get a roll call from the folks that are on the phone. And uh, Mark. This is Dennis Delaney at Mazda. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, Pete Meyer from Honda. David Geiger from Porsche Cars as well. Yeah, Mon we have Mazda, Honda, and Porsche represented. Are there anyone else on the phone? Okay, great. We thank you for that. And now, Mark. Wow, Charlie, where'd you dig up that bio? That's that's a pretty old one. I didn't know it was out there anywhere. I'm going to have to scan the web and find out what's going on there. Um, Today, uh, we want to talk about uh, preemptively thinking about uh, training and, and, and working with the OEMs. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that uh, WorldPAC faces as a training organization, which would be faced by any training organizations. And obviously, the mission of NASDAQ is to Im improve the environment for all technicians out there, shop owners, uh, and dealerships included. I'm going to pool. Uh, everything together today we're going to talk about the technician pool and when I'm talking about the technician pool I'm talking about the entire pool whether it be dealership or aftermarket the aftermarket benefits a great deal from dealership training many technicians in the aftermarket are from dealerships and vice versa these guys move around so when we're talking about the investment in training in the entire pool um, I want to stress how important and, and, and how big the OE investment is. They invest more than anybody does. And then I want to talk about what WorldPAC's doing and, and some of the challenges we're facing. This is kind of interesting because the, the precept of the ETI meeting is pretty exciting. I think a number of years ago, Charlie started moving from uh, let's fix problems that we've had. It seems like we're getting on top of this and we're moving forward with how can we improve everything. When NASDAQ first started, I remember one of the first meetings, actually before NASDAQ started at the Arizona Pilot Project, um, I started throwing out some of these ideas and, and uh, one of the guys from GM said, uh, Mark, I thought we were supposed to work on getting you a level playing field and it seems like you're trying to plant new grass on this field. So. Uh, it's been almost 10 years, I think. I think we're getting ready to plant some new grass on this field, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, let's talk about some of our, our challenges at WorldPAC, anybody's training challenges, whether it be OE or aftermarket. Cost is number one. Um, at WorldPAC, we're fortunate to have uh, resources and, and assets. Uh, it's not a, a uh, profit center in, in WorldPAC. Nor is it a cost center, it's an investment. Um, I've heard some training organizations talk about uh, how much their training organization costs. Um, we see it as a, a substantial investment in, in our shop owner's future. We do management training also in our technician's future. Quality, uh, right along with cost, is an extreme challenge. And we're trying to revitalize the uh, training committee uh, within NASDAQ, and, and that generates the conversation uh, with the OEs about co-licensing training material. At WorldPAC, we have a number of manufacturers we work with. We have numerous relationships. We have some 
that we have virtually carte blanche with their uh, training materials. Uh, we have some that we have some co-licensing agreements. We have some that we have some gentlemen's agreements. We have some that we have no agreement with, and we'd like to move forward with that. And as WorldPAC moves forward with that, we'd like to blaze a trail and create a model for the OEs to work with aftermarket training organizations to get this out. And I'm going to make one central point on quality. Who has the best quality training material? Who's invested the most? OEs. Is any aftermarket training organization going to create the stack of books that BMW, Toyota, Ford, and everybody else create? Nobody's going to create that quality of training material. When you look at the OE training material and you see the ghost images and, and the, the drawn images, the wiring diagrams and all of those things, uh, within the aftermarket, some people can create minor pieces of those, but without co-licensing and, and cross-licensing, that's not going to be available in the aftermarket. And that work has been done, and that work uh, should be used throughout the entire industry. Quality uh, at, at, at WorldPAC, it's mission one, and we really want to work with the manufacturers. We work with quite a few. Material development follows that, that same theme, uh, working with the OEs to, to use their materials and, and recognize their materials, and, and whether it be pay licensing fees, or we'll talk about a few other opportunities uh, that we use at WorldPAC, or whether everybody sees the investment not only in the technician pool, but in what we've always heard before, customer satisfaction. What's the customer experience uh, in the aftermarket? Obviously, dealers and the aftermarket compete for business. Quite frankly, uh, I didn't have an opportunity to look at the numbers, but I think if you go back to forever and forward, I think the dealers pretty much have the same percentage they've always had the aftermarket's pretty close. I think some people move that mark back and forth a little bit. Both organizations are always going to exist. The customer is going to choose uh, where they want to have their car repaired. It's important that they have their car repaired properly and safely at all locations. Uh, attendance uh, for an aftermarket training program, always a challenge. Uh, logistics, are you going to have nighttime classes when the, the guys are falling asleep? Um, that's what PWR training did. We did all nighttime classes. WorldPAC does all daytime classes, uh, Saturday and Sunday classes. Uh, it's a substantial commitment for a technician uh, to give up a weekend or, or a Saturday. Uh, it's always a challenge. Attendance is, is a challenge for all training organizations. Uh, available training from the aftermarket technicians. Um, instructors. Instructors are a challenge. Uh, for WorldPAC, all of our instructors are subject matter experts. And out of our 45 instructors, probably 35 of them are all subject matter experts on a brand. Uh, so at WorldPAC, uh, we have brand specific instructors. They're foremen at dealerships. They're guys that are currently experts on that brand. We teach that brand. We currently use a lot of OE materials. We invest quite a bit in buying OE books. Um, and then for some manufacturers, we're allowed to repurpose those materials. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, convenience, always a challenge. Cost versus quality, uh, talked about that a little bit. Talked about the investment in the aftermarket technician pool. I think we're all investing in it. The old saying that I think we've all heard, a shop owner saying, uh, I'm afraid to train my technician because he might leave. Uh, the counter argument to that being, uh, maybe you don't train him and he stays. Uh, you know, what's worse? Uh, so uh, I, I think everybody is in, in investing in, in, in that. Um, so it, it's a question with available uh, time and funds. I think everybody in here needs to ponder what's an appropriate amount of training. I think we always need to be trying to move the bar forward on that. The conversation with most aftermarket shop owners 
is that 40 hours a year is a pretty good target. Got Tony Callis with us today. He's our Porsche instructor. Tony, how many hours last year did you take of training? Yeah. I don't know. We spent a fortune on it, though, didn't we? <laughs> you took more than two weeks, didn't you? Do you know everything yet? <laughs> uh, the point being, I think, that, that, uh, that in this industry today, a serious target is, is, is two weeks. Um, most of our, our more advanced thinkers are, are, are thinking one week. I think we need to keep moving that bar forward. It's not enough. We know that uh, our, our technicians are, are not trained as well as they should be, and it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, free training, that's always uh, a thought. Um, the experience in the industry is you offer free training and people don't come because um, there's no value there. Just to give a little outline, Whirlpack's training is not free. Uh, we charge pretty well for it. Um, it does not cover the cost. We have uh, some classes that have $400 of OE books in them, have a stack of books that high and, and uh, a substantial investment there, and that's what it takes. Uh, Whirlpack has the resources to contribute to the total investment in the technician pool. I have a great deal of respect for the amount of money that the OEs have spent. Um, and, and when I go around to independent shops and see how many guys were trained at the dealerships, Whirlpack, most of our customers are, uh, or I shouldn't say most, a great deal of our customers are product specialists. And if you go out and interview these guys, you'll find out that most of them came from the dealership arena. That's where they got their original training. Uh, we sponsor a, a, a top high school students, our ASA chapter in Southern Arizona, and we bring in all the top high school students from each high school, and, and we give the instructor recognition, their parents recognition, and that top student um, recognition every year. And, and one year I was a keynote speaker along with Jim Click from Jim Click Ford. He owns about 18 dealerships. And, and a lot of the students in the class were, were happy that they were going to go to work at, at Jim Click Ford. They thought they'd reach the pinnacle. They're going to go to work at it at a dealer and Jim Click got up there and he said I want you to come to work at Jim Click Ford and I want you to take our training and and I want you to be a technician at my dealership so I had the opportunity to speak after him and, 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 and I told the young folks I said I want you to join Jim Click Ford I want you to take their training I want you to learn everything you can and then five years from now I want you to come out in the aftermarket and work in our shops uh, the fact is, uh, the OEMs uh, invest a lot in training and contribute to the entire industry. There's no question about that. Uh, OEMs make the largest investment by far. Uh, material instructor development, uh, instructor training and development, we spend a lot of time. Um, our hybrid class, very much in demand. Uh, our salespeople begging for a hybrid class from Whirlpack for three years. We took three years to find the proper instructor. Uh, we worked very diligently on that, not only to find the right guy, but to invest in Toyota OE materials for the class and get that class out there. And I can't stress how important it is, particularly on the hybrids. Um, I shouldn't say it's a fairly new technology, but, but I, I guess that it is. Uh, we all know the safety issues associated with that. We all know the misgivings. And, and I've got to say this. I've got a friend that went to a hybrid class. They were hooking up a scope to the high voltage system. And the guy teaching the class was poking the wires with a probe. Now here's what I propose to my OE friends out there. In that class, do you want that guy presenting his own materials stapled together? Or would it be better if he had factory materials that were co-licensed and he was using? And a student could actually flip that open and see, don't ever stab these wires. 
And I've been in classes where guys have had an OE book and the instructor was saying one thing and, and technicians in the class were going, yeah, but the book says this. And the instructor is saying, well, I don't agree with that. And you see a lot of guys in the class going, I'm kind of thinking I'm going with the book. <laughs> what do you want trained out there? I, we have all levels of quality. It is impossible to control the aftermarket training, but if you can move your OE materials into the aftermarket training, you have an opportunity for whoever's in that class to be able to look at that and go, I don't think I'm going along. There is one hybrid instructor out there that's telling people that PAG oil is just fine in the Toyota hybrid compressor. Never seen a problem. I don't know how everybody feels in here. I'm, I'm not a suck up to the OEs, but I'll tell you what, when it comes to what it says in the book and I'm doing something for a customer, I'm doing it by the book. And I was in a class where there was an argument going on and I'll, I'll just say it, it was about Toyota antifreeze. And the guy said, this stuff is the same. And I said, why would I use that over the Toyota OE antifreeze. And he said, well, it's $10 cheaper. And I'm thinking, man, how much does a cooling system cost? How much does an engine cost? I'm, myself, in conjunction with that, Rob Morell that I work with, Rob came from the dealership environment, Porsche, BMW, Lexus. Um, we like the OE recommendations. Uh, we, like, we like following that. I think it's pretty important. Uh, integrating OE and aftermarket materials. I'll talk about that just a little bit more here in a second. Cooperation. That's what we're talking about here. To raise the bar in the aftermarket. To raise the service quality for the customer in the entire industry. Uh, to that end, we need the highest quality materials. And the highest quality materials, hands down, developed by the OEs. Um, I, I want to make a couple things right here. Well, I'll, I'll get to that. If the OEs want aftermarket technicians trained to the best standards and finding a mechanism to cooperatively share the materials is the key. The investment in the development of OE materials is already done. I made this statement once in the past and, and it was misinterpreted. And I, I really want to clarify this. It is an obligation by the OEs to generate all these materials so that their service departments can fix these cars. Then that statement was interpreted by a few people that I was saying that it had no value. Quite the contrary. It has tremendous value. And here's the deal. The money has been spent. If we can work in cooperation with the aftermarket and generate more funds, higher customer satisfaction, better service incidents, then we'll all be better off. So I want to make it perfectly clear. The money is spent, that does not mean that we don't recognize the value. There is very high value there. Leveraging that investment into the aftermarket just makes sense. Uh, on the attendance versus logistics, uh, their centralized training, uh, most of the folks we know that are working with centralized trainings other than, than OEs are struggling with attendance. Uh, it's just hard to get people in. Localized training, uh, much more successful. Still always a challenge to bring people in. Hands-on training is hands down what everybody in this industry requests. A lot of these guys are tactile learners. They want hands-on training. Hands-on training raises the bar in terms of cost number of instructors, how many students you can have. Currently, we're doing some hands-on training at Whirlpack with the BMW uh, GTI SSS interface, uh, generally limiting the class to about 10 people per instructor. Uh, very successful, very well received. Um, not at all profitable. <laughs> Available time is also an issue. Uh, Hands-on training, that's what everybody needs. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, difficult to do. Um, quality, training hours are limited. Uh, all training needs to be of the highest quality possible. 
uh, no question. To that end, uh, some of the investment that WorldPAC is making, I'd, I'd like to make that statement. Um, the Vision Show. How many people here went to the Vision Show? Anybody? Okay, we've got quite a few in, in the audience here. I think everybody here is familiar with the Vision Show and the value of the Vision Show. Um, we work very closely with Sherry. We sponsored five instructors. Uh, we sponsored a, a book for John Thornton and a book for um, uh, Bernie Thompson. Uh, those were $60 books with the color in there and, and the hundreds of pages. And unfortunately for me, um, from the success we had in the past, she doubled the attendance in those classes. One had an attendance of 148 people. And I think if you multiply 60 by 148, you'll understand. And one had an attendance of 128 people. So um, we're kind of victims of our own success. But uh, to qualify that, Sherry generally limits uh, her instructors there who aren't sponsored in that way on their books to 40 pages stapled black and white. Well, I should say three hole drilled. Um, so WorldPAC makes a, a substantial investment into the Vision Show, the ATE Show, uh, a number of other uh, ASA events uh, around the country that, that uh, I was going to say we make a good return on that event. I, the, the challenge is, is some of my superiors sometimes ask me how many parts did we sell how, versus how much did that cost. And I tell them it's kind of like Coke hanging out a billboard. I, you know, I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> it, it's a challenge. We invest beyond WorldPAC. That, that's kind of uh, a, a point I wanted to make. Um, at WorldPAC, we have always supported and encouraged NASTAF. Uh, talking to Tony Callis here today, he said none of his friends know what NASTAF is or have ever heard of it. Uh, obviously still one of the best kept secrets in the industry despite all of our efforts to uh, make it to the, the contrary. Every WorldPAC class uh, has discussed that. Uh, we steer all of our customers to the OE websites. Why do we steer them to the OE websites? Because that's where all the information is. If you want to fix cars properly, that's where it is. All right, I've got that. A couple other things I want to cover here real quick. Yes. Tony, for me, if you just put handcuffs on one guy and drag him in, I think we could double our attendance. Uh, we, we all know what a challenge, uh, what, it, what a challenge it's been. I want to talk about what WorldPAC does with some of the OEs that we're working with. Um, I, I'm not trying to criticize any OEs, but a lot of OEs, from what we can see, they do new car product training uh, to their technicians and somehow the assumption is is that that technician is going to be at that dealership forever and and while people move around we are actually having an issue right now with one manufacturer that after about three years they quit printing those manuals well that's about the time that we want to start picking them up and and distributing them so we need to work with some manufacturers to continue printing some legacy materials uh, we've worked with one manufacturer, and, and while they do their, their product inter introduction manuals, what they'd have is you'll have an engine section, you'll have a body section, a chassis section, you'll have all these different sections. For us in our training sessions, we're trying to train uh, technicians on five to six years of engines. We break it down in a class into an engine class, a chassis class, and a body class. And so, while those OE materials are very valuable, the way they're laid out as to that individual car per year uh, to cover five or six years doesn't work well for us. They've allowed us to take that engine material out of those new car introduction manuals, repurpose that, 
into an engine manual that covers five or six years, and then we can cover that. The interesting thing is, is that some one manufacturer is actually publishing those manuals for us. So we took their material, uh, repurposed it into a, a consolidated book on, on one subject covering many years, and now they're, they're redistributing that to their own technicians, particularly their technicians that are coming in, that have just come in and, and don't know those old body styles. Um, talking to a bunch of folks here recently, and, and uh, I've, I've been in some shops and some dealerships and guys complaining uh, about an older car came in with points and condensers and either nobody or one guy in the shop knew how to set it up or whatever. I was doing a class and this young kid raised his hand once and he goes, uh, Mr. Warren? I go, yeah, he goes, you're pretty old. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know. And he goes, what's this D-well thing? <laughs> I said to him, I said, you know, do you have a meter? And he goes, yeah. He goes, do you have duty cycle on there? He goes, yeah. I go, it's kind of like that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, you know, the dealers are fixing legacy cars. One of these days, I think I'm going to get a hold of one of my old customers with an air-cooled Volkswagen, and I'm just going to pull into the Volkswagen dealer and see what they do. See if they <laughs> greet me. <laughs> oh, boy, you're here. Or if they're just standing there going, what, what the hell is that? <laughs> uh, so, so we would really like to work with manufacturers. Quite often, um, the manuals that you produce are, are spectacular. Uh, they're more year specific. Uh, we would like to repurpose those materials and we would like to work with manufacturers. We have some manufacturers that uh, we supply our printed materials to. We have one manufacturer that we had a whole catalog of all of their videos they ever made. And somehow at headquarters, somebody managed to clean out that closet for them. And they actually called us up and they said, you know those videos you've got? And we're like, yeah, and they're going, I think we could get a copy of them. So um, I want everybody to know that, that it's bi-directional. Um, and, and, and we can offer uh, some value in that arena, particularly in the, in the training arena. Um, finally, I have struggled over the years. Uh, with STS, I went to SAE meetings. And I thought, I'll convince these SAE guys of what it is we need. And I'll go to these meetings and I'll convince people of what it is we need. And, and quite frankly, uh, the engineers that I, I went and met didn't need any convincing that we needed technical information in the aftermarket. I don't think anybody in here needs convincing. The challenge, as I see it, the biggest challenge is the legal department, understanding the value and, and, and what's associated there and particularly manufacturers that are import manufacturers that need to go to the parent company offshore, uh, it can be a challenge to say why you should work with WorldPack and, and why we should work together on training materials and, and specifically why you should work with a competitor. And so here's my argument. I think all the OEs in here are a member of the Alliance or the Global Automakers Association. If you're members of those groups, you're members of those groups who are direct competitors. Why are you a member of that group? Because you have common interest. And I assert, as we're looking at the training, although we're World Pack and you're an OE, we have common interest here. We have common interest in and, and getting these cars serviced. And to that common interest, and, and at the hazard of complimenting uh, my friend Ron Pyle here, um, I was a member of ASA in Arizona. And I was on the board and met regularly with my friends in ASA in Arizona, Dave Lansbury being one. Who was I meeting with? I was meeting with my independent aftermarket direct competitors in Tucson, wasn't I? And, and why would I want to share information with them? Why did we have an association? Because we had common interests. We had things that we needed to band together 
to get things done, whether legislatively, locally. And, and, and in that vein, one day I was sitting down with uh, the board and I was lamenting the fact, this was very many years ago, that the brake franchises were taking my business by advertising a $69.95 lifetime brake job. And my customers asked me if I could do it for that and I told them no. And then they went there and then every single one of them when they came back had all new calipers, all new rotors, all new everything that maybe they needed, maybe they didn't need. They went in for $69.95 and everybody came out for 500 bucks. And I'd, I'd just given up and I told that and Bill Ratzliff said, oh, I got a solution for that. I said, well, what's the solution, Bill? He said, oh, I tell them to go there and get an estimate. I'll beat it by 10%. He goes, I'm making a fortune. Okay, This is my direct competitor. Bill Ratzliff is two miles down the street from me, sharing information. I think that whether it be WorldPAC, CarQuest, Napa, smaller training organizations, we definitely all have a common interest in technician training. We're all sharing from the same technician pool. What we want to start here, our, 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 our first initiative in working with the revitalizing perhaps the training committee within NASDAQ is, is working with the OEs to find out what it takes monetarily working together to cross license that material so that we can bring the best training into the aftermarket. Any questions? I'm set, thank you. <laughs>